Hi hey everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us online for tonight's event with Jasmine Chan, Jean Chan Ho, and Waiki Wang, celebrating the School for Good Mothers, Fiona and Jane, and Joan is okay. This is one of our first events of the new year. We could not be more excited to have Jasmine, Jean, and Waiki with us today. My name is Lily Philpott. I am the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. A quick visual description of me. Um, I have brown skin, short black hair that is pulled back, round glasses with black frames. I'm wearing a black shirt and big silver earrings. This event is taking place across multiple time zones, so please do say hi and let us know in the chat where you are watching from. I am speaking to you today from Brooklyn, New York, where I am on ancestral and unceded Canarsie and Munsee Lenape land. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian and Pacific diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one, organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers, run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and publish an award-winning online magazine, The Margins. You can find out more by visiting us at aaww.org, or you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. During this event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We are going to open our event with a reading from the School for Good Mothers, Fiona and Jane and Joan is okay, followed by conversation. And then we'll have time for audience Q&A. So please submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our first reader this evening will be Jasmine Chan, and I'll introduce her and then be back to introduce Jean and Waiki. Jasmine Chan's short stories have appeared in Tin House and Epoch. A former reviews editor, Publishers Weekly, she holds an MFA from Columbia University and a BA from Brown University. She lives in Chicago with her husband and daughter, and The School for Good Mothers is her first novel. Please join me in welcoming Jasmine. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone for being here and thank you Lily for the intro. It's definitely a dream come true to do an event with um, Asian American Writers Workshop. So I'm gonna read from chapter two of the School for Good Mothers. So this is after Frida has her uh, very bad day and she has cameras all over her house now. And so this is uh, the beginning of uh, the surveillance in her life. Frida is tempted not to go home tonight considers getting a room at the Campus Inn, finding a last minute rental on Airbnb, taking an impromptu trip to visit long neglected friends in Brooklyn. Sleeping in her cubicle is a possibility, though this afternoon her boss noticed that the Harriet photos on her desk were turned face down and started asking questions. I was trying to concentrate, she lied. With her boss out of sight, she righted the photos and stroked them and apologized. Harriet as a tightly swaddled newborn, Harriet grabbing at her first birthday cake. Harriet in heart-shaped sunglasses and a plaid romper at the beach. That face, the only thing she ever did right. She stays until 11, long after the building empties, until her fear of getting mugged on campus outweighs her fear of what awaits her at home. She called Renee throughout the day. Renee was alarmed to hear about the cameras, but said with a heavy sigh that the rules are always changing. Avoiding the house isn't an option, nor is arming herself with information. Not that Frida found much online, only the usual think pieces about experiments using big data, social media addiction, the unholy relationship between the government and tech companies, the live streaming of childbirth and violent crime, controversies about infant influencers on YouTube, whether secret nanny cams were civil rights violation, smart socks and blankets that measure a baby's heart rate and oxygen levels and the quality of their sleep a smart bassinet that sleep trains your baby for you. Everyone has been observed through their devices for years. CCTV cameras have been installed in most American cities. The government inspired by lowered crime rates in London and Beijing. Who isn't using facial recognition software? At least, Renee said, these are cameras you can see. Frida should assume that they're listening. Anything a normal person might do could be interpreted as defiance. Don't leave too many footprints, Renee said. Stop it with the Google searches. They can tap into Frida's work computer too. 
she shouldn't be discussing her case on the phone. Renee has heard rumors about C CPS revamping its educational arm. They've been updating their parenting classes. Silicon Valley is supposedly contributing money and resources. CPS has been on a hiring spree. They're offering much higher salaries than before. Unfortunately, Frida lives in the test state, the test county. I wish I had more details, Renee went on. If this had happened a year ago or even a few months ago, I'd be in a better position to guide you. She paused. Let's talk in person. Please, Frida, try to stay calm. The house, which has never felt like hers, feels even less so tonight. After eating a microwave dinner, after straightening each room, mopping the dirt tracked in by CPS, closing drawers, folding Harriet's bedding, and rearranging the toys, Frida retreats to her cramped bathroom, wishing she could collapse her life into this room, sleep and eat here. She showers and scrubs her face, applies toners and moisturizers and anti-aging serums. She combs her wet hair, clips and files her nails, bandages her torn cuticles. She tweezes her eyebrows. Sitting on the edge of the tub, she pokes through the bucket of bath toys, the wind-up walrus, the ducky, the orange octopus that's lost its eyeballs. She plays with Harriet's robe. She rubs Harriet's lotion on her hands so she can wear the coconut scent to sleep. Though it's a warm evening, she layers a hooded sweatshirt over her nightgown. Cringing at the thought of the men touching her pillows, she decides to change her sheets. She gets into bed and pulls up her hood and ties it under her chin, wishing she had a shroud. Soon, the state will discover that she rarely has visitors. She lost touch with her New York friends after the divorce, hasn't made new ones, hasn't been trying, spends most of her solo evenings in the company of her phone. She sometimes eats cereal for dinner. When she can't sleep, she does stomach crunches and leg lifts for hours. If the insomnia gets bad, she takes Unisom and drinks. If Harriet is here, just one shot of bourbon. If she's alone, three or four in quick succession. Thank God those men didn't find any empties. Each morning before breakfast, she measures her waist. She pinches her flabby triceps and inner thighs. She smiles at herself in the mirror to remind herself that she used to be pretty. She needs to quit every bad habit, can't appear vain or selfish or unstable, as if she can't take care of herself, was perhaps unprepared, even at this age, to take care of a child. She turns on her side and faces the window. She lifts a hand to her mouth and stops. She looks up at the blinking red light. Is she giving them enough? Is she sorry enough, afraid enough? In her 20s, she had a therapist who made her list her fears, a tedious process that only revealed that her fears were random and boundless. Whoever is watching now should know that she's afraid of forests and large bodies of water, stems and seaweed, long distance swimmers, people who know how to breathe underwater generally. She's afraid of people who know how to dance. She's afraid of nudists and Scandinavian furnishings, television shows that begin with a dead girl, too much sunlight and too little. Once she was afraid of the baby growing inside her, afraid that it might stop growing, afraid that the dead baby would have to be suctioned out, that if this happened and she didn't want to try again, Gust might leave her. She was afraid that she might succumb to her second thoughts, take herself to a clinic, claim that the bleeding happened naturally. Tonight, she's afraid of the cameras, the social worker, the judge, the waiting, what Gust and Susanna might be telling people, the daughter who might love her less already, how devastated her parents will be when they find out. In her head, she repeats the new fears, trying to leech the words of meaning. Her heart is beating too fast. Her back is coated with cold sweat. Perhaps instead of being monitored, a bad mother should be thrown into a ravine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. It's beautiful. Um, next, we are going to welcome Jean Chen Ho to read from Fiona and Jane. Jean Chen Ho is a doctoral candidate in creative writing and literature at the University of Southern California, where she is a Dornstay Fellow in fiction. She has an MFA from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and her writing has been published in the Georgia Review, GQ, Harper's Bazaar, Guernica, The Rumpus, Apogee, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and others. She was born in Taiwan, grew up in Southern California, and lives in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Jean. Hi, am I on? Am I here? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it's just echoing what Jasmine said. It's really a dream to have uh, an event with the Asian American Writers Workshop. 
Um, and thank you, Jasmine, for that reading. I, I, ha I had messaged Jasmine earlier this week to tell her that I had a nightmare upon starting to read her book. And by the end of finishing it, if you haven't read it, you, it is such an emotional roller coaster and so good. Um, so I'm going to read from Fiona and Jane, my link story collection. Um, the tone is quite different from <laughs> uh, Jasmine's beautiful book. And I'm going to read from a short story in here uh, called Kenji's Notebook. And uh, Fiona and Jane is about two best friends who grew up together and then it spans 20 years of their friendship. And because it's told in alternating voices, there are some stories from Jane's point of view, some from Fiona's point of view. So I'm gonna read from a story that's from Fiona's point of view. She's in her twenties, she's moved to New York. She uh, has just broken up with a guy named Jasper who um, is currently getting his MFA at an institution in New York City. So maybe that is some of the people here. Um, and. For this part of the story, Jasper is, this is from Jasper's point of view, actually. So, Helen Park. He'd been resentful that their classmates assumed the two struck up an alliance because they were the only two Asian American fiction writers in their year. In fact, Jasper had intentionally ignored Helen's friendly glances during the orientation events. He'd also made a point to steer clear of Fong Li, a poet in the year above, to combat the stereotype that all Asians stuck together. Jasper wasn't going to be pigeonholed. He thought Helen was a lesbian at first. She wore her short black hair gelled into spikes, a rotating uniform of loose chambray shirts topped by colorful fringe scarves, and always some clown lipstick was painted on her mouth, bright tangerine, sparkly purple, and occasionally goth metal black. He made it through the fall without engaging her much, but a month into the spring semester, she'd plopped down next to him at the bar where everyone congregated after workshop and called him out. You're avoiding me, right? Though her lips were parted in a smile, she delivered the line as if lobbing an insult, her eyes glittering. He'd noticed then that Helen had a tooth on the side of her grin shaped like a fang. I have a girlfriend, he blurted out. Helen snorted. Relax, she said. Girlfriend, cool. Well, what is she? What do you mean, what is she, he said. She's a law student. Helen shook her head. Her hair didn't move. No, I mean, like, is she Asian? She's Taiwanese, Jasper said. Helen raised an eyebrow. So what? Why don't you ever invite her out with us? Everyone else brings their booze and randos. I don't know, she's busy. He didn't want to tell her that Fiona would find their conversations about books, writing, their professors, insufferable. Jasper had long suspected that Fiona wasn't totally on board with his writing ambitions. The program was designed to accommodate working professionals, but Jasper had insisted on quitting his day job to fully immerse himself in the MFA. He had some savings and took out a student loan he wanted to chance a higher amount, max out both the subsidized and unsubsidized federal limits, but Fiona had advised against it. What about all your law school debt, he'd said. That's different, she replied. After I finish, I'll actually... She didn't finish the sentence, just let the words hang there. He'd been stung by her frankness, though he knew she was only being pragmatic. Why'd you ask if she's Asian, Jasper said. You seem like... I don't know, Helen shrugged, your stories and workshop, what? She shrugged again. Helen was only a year out of college, the same age Jasper was when he moved to New York with Fiona. That night at the bar, she told him to stop writing stories about white people. He'd scoffed and then they'd argued. Just because I don't indicate what race the characters are doesn't automatically mean they're white. Um, yeah, dude, it reads like that. Sorry to break it to you. Not true, that's your own racist reading bias, not my problem. Until Jasper realized their raised voices had attracted everyone else's attention. The others from their workshop stood around the bar clutching PBR cans, staring at them. Jasper stood suddenly, knocking over his bar stool. 
He tossed down a few bills and stormed out. Helen followed him. They shouted at each other out on the sidewalk. Frustrated, he grabbed her hard by both arms. He thought maybe he would shake her. An alarmed expression crossed Helen's wide and dark eyes. Jasper remembered himself. Then she was leading him to another bar where they took shots and kept arguing. But there was laughter in it now and something else, something more dangerous, Jasper recalled. Later still, when he followed her up the stairs to her apartment on Delancey, Helen was going to lend him her copy of Teresa Huck and Cha's Dick T. Jasper thought, nothing's happened yet and nothing might happen anyway. Pull yourself together, Chang. When he got home that night, Jasper took a scalding shower before falling into bed with Fiona. Six years together. Fiona wasn't the first girl he slept with, but she was pretty close to it. Jasper promised himself that it was only going to be that one time with Helen. The sex wasn't anything spectacular and her room smelled vaguely like cat piss. The next Monday after workshop, however, they fucked again. Then another time, another day of the week until Jasper couldn't remember why it mattered as though he'd somehow believed that cheating on Fiona if done on a Monday gave him moral immunity. And I will stop there. Thank you, Sarika. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, next, we will have uh, Waiki Wong join us. Um, just give me one moment to get settled. Um, so last but certainly not least, please join me in welcoming Waiki. Waiki Wang was born in Nanjing, China, and grew up in Australia, Canada, and the United States. She is a graduate of Harvard University, where she earned her undergraduate degree in chemistry and her doctorate in public health. Her first novel, Chemistry, received the Penn Hemingway Award for debut fiction, the Plowshares John C. Zacharias First Book Award, and a Whiting Award. She is a five under 35 honoree of the National Book Foundation, and her work has appeared in The New Yorker. She currently lives in New York City. Thank you me in welcoming Waiki. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have such a good group. Um, and thank you, Jasmine and Jean, for reading those great pieces. I really recommend both those books. They just take you to such different worlds. Um, with Jasmine's book, you're sort of taken into the future and then the present. And I think with Jean's book, you're in the present, but it's this history of friendship. And I think girlhood is very rarely written well, and Jean does it incredibly well. Um, and that's why both these books I finished, I think in a day and a half each. Um, so I'm so blessed to be here and happy new year to everyone. Um, so I will read, uh, I think three pages from Joan is Okay. Um, this comes in, I think probably a third of the book or close to the halfway point. Um, by this point, the only context that you really need to know is that Joan is an ICU doctor um, and her father has died. That happens on page two. I'm not spoiling it for anyone. Um, and she's sort of reminiscing about, you know, her relationship with her father at this point and also her upbringing. The first counselor deduced that I had trouble seeing boundaries. My arm crossing father who came to initial meetings replied that boundaries were a Western trait a luxury, an act of selfishness. No such boundary existed within our family as the self does not exist. And if the self does not exist, then there can be nothing to invade. My father also added that I seem fine and these meetings were stupid. We can see how you would think so, the counselor said, but we worry about your daughter, an excellent student, but has trouble connecting with her peers, is rigid and flexible. Things have to be done a certain way, according to Joan, according to her peers. She should be tested for dot, dot, dot. And each counselor gave a list. She's shy, said my father. But sometimes she has outbursts. Is she physically violent? No one is suggesting that. Then I don't see the problem. We're not suggesting there is a problem. We too want Joan to succeed. Does she need your permission to do so? He wanted to ask but couldn't get it out clearly, and the counselor didn't seem to understand him. She needs no one's permission, not mine, not yours, and because this was the, this was the extent of his English, while well, angry and arm crossed, he just repeated the phrase, not mine, not yours, until it was time for us to go. The last counselor I saw was in college, freshman year. 
She asked if I had ever met with a counselor who was more like myself, a well-meaning question that she asked cautiously and in a circular way at 7.30 a.m. before I had a class at eight. I think the question, I think the word she didn't want to use was Asian, the non-existent Asian therapist. Had I ever met one of those? To understand difference requires difference and someone who has been in your shoes. At least she was the one counselor to admit not quite getting it instead of trying to pinpoint a fault. After her, I would have no more time for counselors. And once I started my training, I needed only to turn to the person beside me in lecture to know that we were the same. At face value, medicine was still a meritocracy and the most straightforward path that I could take. Moving through the ranks had less to do with what I looked like or my family, but had everything to do with if I could watch and listen carefully, if I could carry out the tasks that were asked of me and then pass the same instructions on when my turn came to teach. The joy of having been standardized was that you didn't need to think beyond a certain area. Like a death handled well, a box had been put around you and within it, you could feel safe. Had my father been happy raising me, been happy to be my father? And had I posed those questions to him, would he have considered them important questions or simply Western ones? Americans he found to be so outwardly happy all the time and su superficially positive. To be indiscriminately happy seemed to him as much of a curse as to be indiscriminately sad. We often went months without speaking, not out of annoyance with each other or any real reason except that there wasn't a need. The longest stretch was a year in my mid-20s when, when I was body deep in clerkships and my father was, as usual, busy. I spoke to my mother that year and to him indirectly through her. Tell dad about this. And she said that she would. The year of no contact ended just as casually as it began. He called me about his vertigo, a possible ear infection, and some red fungal spots on his chest. I asked if he had seen a doctor. And he said, wasn't I the doctor, his daughter the doctor? Unless the doctor was not in today and it was just his daughter. If just the latter was in, he would call back tomorrow for the doctor. My father could be playful, mixed in with Asian stoicism and formality. I said, no, the doctor was here today and ready to receive patients. Then we went through his symptoms and I told him the kind of medication to buy and how often to put it on. It was a 20 minute conversation, one of the longest that, I, that we would have. Thanks, doctor, daughter, or do you prefer daughter, doctor, which one? I said the former was fine. All right then, doctor, daughter, so long, goodbye. But the phrase for goodbye in Chinese is zaijian, or see you again. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, nice to have read with you guys. That was really nice. I loved all of your readings. Um, I love both of your books so much. No, likewise. I mean, I think, you know, I read it in this like fever of trying to, you know, read everything, but it was so enjoyable. I don't know if I've ever, I think when you write, you don't always read for enjoyment. You're sort of reading for kind of like figuring out what's out there and what's, you know, what, like the publishing world and things like that. So it was really, I, I, I was so glad to read your books and um, it was, and congratulations on both of you guys. These are first books. First books are so special. It's like your first baby. Um, the veteran of the group. <laughs> a little bit, but not not by much. You guys are teaching me a lot about writing. Um, and I think, you know, maybe one of the things that we all want to know or writers want to know is sort of process. And I think Jean was curious about outlines. And I thought, you know, we should we should talk about that. <laughs> I had a question for you guys because, uh, well, you know, my book is a linked story collection, but people have been saying it's a novel. I've stopped trying to fight it, but I am currently working on my second book, which I intend to be a novel and might, who knows, maybe it'll turn into a story collection anyway. But I wanted to ask the two of you as novelists, you know, did you outline what was your process for writing? Um, I mean, at Waikia, I guess you can talk about this book or your first one. And I'm really curious, like, did you know the 
ending of your books? Like how, what was the process for both of you guys? Who, who wants to go first? Jasmine, why don't you go first? I feel like I read and then why don't you go first? Um, yeah, after, after um, Jane introduced herself, I realized that I totally didn't even explain what my book is about. So, so it's a, so the School for Good Mothers is about um, Frida Liu, a Chinese American single mom who loses custody of her toddler daughter after leaving her home on one very bad day. And you know, she has to spend a year at a imaginary government run reform school in order to get her back. So that's what I should have said before reading in order to um, make the reading actually make sense. But thank you for everyone for following along with me. So uh, when you when uh, Jane suggested talking about outlines, I'm like, oh, the outlines are very aspirational for me. Like I aspire. <laughs> to be a writer who uses outlines. But whenever I've told people that I didn't outline this book, I think they're very bewildered because it's a very methodical book, but, but it was not an organized process to write it. Like I pretty much, I, I wrote longhand. So I wrote the whole first draft longhand, which is a really wow. insane way to work. It's like the most, it, like it, it worked out in the end, but it was like, the slowest possible way to work. But it's partly because um, on screen, I just want to fix everything. Like I, like I, the minute I type something on screen, I want to correct it and make it perfect. And so the only way I can get, escape that tendency is to like just actually be with a notebook. And so I wrote the whole first draft from start to finish and then I started editing. So the only real outline I was working from was I did have a like imaginary curriculum for the school that I made up very early on in the process to develop um, the courses and the lessons within each sequence. And because it was so complicated to figure out, I kind of had to stick with it. Like one, one thing that um, we talked about once I actually sold the book was whether or not to like how to get rid of lessons because there were too many, like how to how to vary the structure a little bit. But I, it was so complicated to put together, I kind of couldn't undo it. So um, the structure, the, the sequences and the lessons I came up with in 2015 have just stuck to the very end, partly because I, I, I couldn't unravel the, the system that I had created. But I had that and I had a list of characters. But besides that, it was more like, writing by instinct, making a mess and then fixing it. So I, I hear that there is a, a more efficient, logical way to do things. I just haven't gotten there yet. I don't think anyone's gotten there. Like the writing is the most inefficient thing I've ever done in my life. I just, you know, I, I think I've done a lot of efficient stuff. But it's just like, it's so crazy. But I think one thing that I don't outline, you know, Jean knows this, you guys know this, I don't outline until I finish it. But I think one thing that is helpful and um, Jasmine, you mentioned is like the timeline. You gotta get the timeline right. Like figure out in this month what's happening in this month what's happening. Um, and I tend to do that more later but usually after I finish the book. Um, you just don't know so much of writing is you sit down for four hours and you figure out what you're going to write which I've tried to explain to people and I think nobody, you know, unless you're a writer, you don't really understand that, but sort of this exploratory, you sit down, you figure it out, you lay the tracks, right? And then you can figure out where the train is going. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, every, every teacher I know has told me to outline. No writer I know has ever outlined. So I don't know what to make of this <laughs> advice. <right? laughs> but isn't it, isn't it like show, don't tell? If you showed everything, every book would be 5,000 pages long. Yes. That's true. Like, so, so there, there actually still has to be some telling and some summarizing and like, it can't all be dialogue. It can't all be scenes. Like, like I did show don't tell for my first draft and it was like a gazillion pages long and like every scene went on for 50 pages. But at some point it can only, at some point you write the 50 pages to get those sentence that you need. Right, you have to like truncate it, yeah. Um, Wait, Jasmine, I have a follow-up question. So you actually have like, a notebook of the act, the curriculum? Yeah, as... I, I mean, I have many, many bins of like the the drafts that got left behind along the way. But um, I, I mean, I had to come up with the curriculum just to understand um, like what the, the structure would be. Like yeah, I, I made yeah. the imaginary program very early on and I, like that was before having a kid. So, but I actually stuck with it. Um, in the end, um, because I, I think as I was writing, I came up with 
with plot elements that would that would be a good match with what was going on in the school. And so there is some some organization, but then just a lot of feeling my way through it. Are you are you using are you asking about outlines from the perspective of someone who's using them now? Well, I'm trying to, well, I was just going to say, like, if you release that curriculum, I feel like that would be like such scary bonus, like creepy bonus <laughs> material that I would love to read further about. Um, Cause I think it works really well for the novel. Um, I am trying to use an outline for my second book. Um, I don't know. I don't think I'll follow it that closely, um, but it's nice to have a target. You know what I mean? And then I'll probably land somewhere near the target. Um, but with Fiona and Jane, I did not have an outline. I didn't even know I was writing a book. I don't know about you guys, but like publishing a book just felt so incredibly far off and impossible when I started writing this as individual stories. So I was just trying to get to know the characters and I had like really no sense of how to put a story collection together. And it just all was like very organic as well. I think that's the best way to do it. I do think so much of the magic is lost when you sort of plan out everything, right? Um, and for both of you guys, it's sort of, you know, the re you can't surprise the reader if when you're writing, you're not surprised, right? So that 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 I think sometimes the outline like pulls away because you, you know, get here, but it doesn't quite work. Um, so I, I do think both of your sort of like endings and just like your arcs were just very intuitive. And that's, you know, that's what makes the reading experience so enjoyable, I think. I have to be corny for a second because I know that you you guys met my daughter like during the the green room section <laughs> um, like I so I didn't expect to get quite so emotional like reading both of your books um because because it it both of them kicked up so many memories of childhood and like dating in New York and like so much Chinese family stuff that it's like I don't really talk about in my daily life and, I so so please excuse my corniness. I'm really excited that my daughter is growing up in a world where I can like hand her these two books when she's old enough to read them. <laughs> and because I I mean growing up in the 80s, like there, there was the Joy Luck Club and the Kitchen God's Wife, and that's about it. And like the woman warrior, maybe. Um, but it's it's just really exciting to read about contemporary Chinese women in literature I mean that's just like it's not common enough that, that that's like an average experience so right. and I was um I was telling Waika that I I felt so seen and then I didn't even realize that Joan's uh, parents have the same English that's name crazy. When that you was such a crazy coincidence like what does that even mean so it was weird. so funny I'm like how can their names be James and Susie those are the names that <laughs> the parents chose. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I was just thinking what are some of the common, you know, with names, it's so hard, right? I mean, for my first book, I didn't name anyone because names are so stressful for me mm -hmm. because with names come sort of identity issues and you have to think about those. Um, and with this book, I was like, I had to just identify that. So I needed a name that I could easily translate. And then, you know, I was like, what are the most common names that parents I know chose? And um, I sort of just like shot a dart there. Um, but I was so shocked, Jasmine, when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine, I feel like you have to buy a lottery ticket, which is yeah. like also in Waikis book, right? But yeah. <laughs> like there's there's like witchy energy there. Yeah. Um, that's that's so great. I mean, what do you, you know, I think people want to know about kind of like um what are what were your publishing experiences for both of your books? You know, I think it's actually really good to to kind of think about because. When I was going through MFA, I was, you know, told like you had to write a novel or stories or whatever. It was just very, very confusing. Um, did you guys both have good debut experiences? Because I did, but I was very grateful for. And I, I, I hope you guys are having good debut experiences. Um, Jean, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I am. It's it's really been a dream. Um, I mean, also, I feel like you know, the world has changed so much in the last couple of years because of this pandemic. So I almost feel like living through this experience and, you know, it's ongoing, of course, um, really made me feel like, wow, I have no expectations for <laughs> anything really, you know, like, because there was a time in 2020 when I was like, I can't plan for tomorrow. Like, I don't know what next week's going to be. So it was like really a soul lesson to relinquish control. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, so I think in that context, it was already going to be different, perhaps from people who didn't live through the pandemic and publish a book in this time. But it's been it's been really wonderful to get so much support from my publisher, Viking, um, and from my agents, too. So I can't I have no complaints. It's just been a lot of fun. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a really lucky experience. I think the thing that has been the most surreal about it is to have like this big career milestone and like be interacting a lot with people on the internet, but actually see almost no one in real life mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. um, my, my daughter just got her second vaccine dose last week. And oh, so, that's, that's yeah, congrats. I mean, that's you. we've been counting the days to this moment for a long time, but, but it's going to be another few weeks before we can like say, contemplate taking her to a museum or, or something like that. I mean, we're probably not gonna do that, <laughs> if, if we're being honest. But I mean, we've had a very um, a very isolated home life as parents of a small child. So so it's been um, it's been really strange to like like a beautiful experience to publish a book, but also um, it, a very surreal on a daily level to like just only see my my husband and child and parents occasionally so when I when I finally did make it out of the house to like go to bookstores and see my, and like bookstores besides my my very uh, favorite local shop and and try to like just leave my block a little bit more that was very exciting but like early early January I think was a just a tough time for everyone so it was a lot of career happiness but a lot of like global sorrow mm, totally what about uh, you, Mikey? Like, you know, you published a book before all of this happened and then now you're yeah. publishing your second book yeah. after the pandemic or in the ongoing pandemic. How do yeah. you feel? I feel great. You guys have so much to look forward to with the second book just because I remember at the end of chemistry, I was just like struck with anxiety because first of all, for some reason, you know, you're, you're worried that like, oh, maybe this was a fluke or, you know, like the stupid imposter syndrome or whatever with writing um and then I had Hajin who was my thesis advisor telling me he's very paternal he's like Waiki the second book is the hardest so you know you have to work really hard but if it fails that's okay you have to get to your third book <laughs> and I was like okay thank you Hajin that was very very encouraging um, I will fail through my second one and then get to the third one where I will succeed um so I think I had like I just had a lot of anxiety and I just want to say that the second book is really not as scary as people think it is and you're going to have so much fun with it and on the other side and um, if you have any anxiety after your first book because both of your books are doing so well um, I would just forget about it because it's it's dumb you guys are all both talented writers so I just want to kind of encourage you guys um, but but publishing the second book has been kind of odd since I switched houses I was at Knopf and then I went to Random House I had a new editor, so it felt like starting over. Um, and, you know, getting to know an editor is sort of like dating again, like you're sort of, you know, in a marriage relationship and you're kind of figuring out each other's um, tics. Um, and so that was really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a completely different experience with the first book, the editing process was different. With this book, it's different. And I think um, that's what makes writing so interesting because the editorial process is, you know, always, it depends on the editor and the experience. Um, and I had a, I'm having a good time with this one. Um, and I, I hope you guys, you know, your tours are all very, very good and packed and um, I hope it all continues. So yeah, nothing to be scared about for the second book. It's gonna be fine. Don't listen to Hajit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was just saying it to challenge me because he knew I was up for a challenge. And oh, something. that's very like Chinese dad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then when it went well, he was like, you know, I knew you could do it. I was like, you didn't, <laughs> oh, you didn't say that okay. four years ago. But <laughs> I, I will say that the, the hard thing, so I don't have a second book started yet. And the hard thing about that, I mean, I, I personally feel fine about that. But the hard thing is you're asked about it in every single bit yes. of press, like every... Um, not every, not every event, because my event partners have been very like, like gentle with me on that question. But if everyone told me to start a second uh, project, but in the time when I could have done that, I just moved to another city and used my little bit of free time to like relocate. So, um, ev so everyone had told me to start another project, and I will just say for the the writers watching that 
the benefit of having other projects started is then you have an answer to that question. Like, yeah. what are you working on now? Because you will be asked it like over and over and over again. No, it's true. Um, and both of your books are making such a splash. You know, I think probably we have a lot of writers here or, you know, early writers. And I think maybe I would just ask the question, like for both of you guys, do you feel there's a pressure for, you know, being a woman, a person of color in publishing and writing? Um, the sense of, and that's something that I just worry about. So I'm just telling you my anxiety, um, sort of being this like <laughs> flash in the pan, temporary kind of like, you know, very temporary thing versus something that people read for a long, long, long period of time. Like how, how do you feel about that, you know, with your own writing? Oh, so existential. <laughs> Too deep, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we we were emailing about this and I thought yeah, it was really I want to know your answers. I'm like, I, I stress about this. So I'm curious. I don't know. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but for me, it's almost like going through this process. I almost feel like my book is not even a part of me anymore. Do you know what I mean? Because you have to like let it, you have to let go of it like through so many stages. Like the first time you show it to your agent, the first time you have the draft for your editor and then I just feel like even through in the last month, you know, it's it's out in bookstores and people can read it and people have had like various responses, positive, meh and negative. And I just feel like I can't attach myself to the external evaluation of my book. Like I wrote the best book that I could write. And, you know, if, if it does become something that people continue to read in a year, five years, you know, a hundred years, it's almost, it's like, that's, that's just a whole different thing than me personally, you know, like, I'm just going to continue living my life and having fun and, you know, joking around and being a dirtbag. <laughs> no, so much was out of your control. So my, yeah. Um, my video is glitching a little bit, so I might have missed, um, my, my, my video is glitching a bit, so I might have missed some of that. Um, so to answer your question, I think the I mean, the dream is to have your book stay in print. Um, right. That is uh, not uh, that easy to do. So I think, I think when like when I was working at PW, I think when I one of the things that really struck me was just how many debuts are published every year and like how many are launched every season. How and many do you do? You, did they give you a number? Um, I don't think we ever got a number, but it was it's a it's there are there's more debut fiction published in a year than you would think. Um, and I think what, what really struck me is that the, the dream is to like have a book that that makes an impact beyond its launch month or launch season, because with publishing, it's always like the next thing. Mm -hmm. And like even like, like the January books make way for the February books, the February books make way for the March books. And then and then like you get to the fall and like all the famous people publish their books. So it's it's definitely like looking, it's like always looking three months ahead, always looking six months ahead. So um, to be to be read beyond your your like burst of attention, um, I think is is its own like elusive thing. Yeah. I also think it's, you know, to your question about whether this is a flash in the pan or Asian American women writers are still going to be published and whatever. Like I have always been reading Asian American writers, like, you know, as Jasmine mentioned in the eighties and nineties, we probably only had, um, you know, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, yeah. Amy Tan, Bharati Mukherjee. And then, you know, now there's so many more of us out there because they paved the way. Right. But I think I I have always made it a practice to, you know, I guess this is like very pandering because we're at the Asian American Writers Workshop, <laughs> but I'm gonna continue like reading your books like for a really long time, you know? Um, I'm gonna think about Joan, I'm gonna be thinking about Frida and that weird Emmanuel doll for <laughs> like, whether I want to or not, because it's just so arresting, you know? So They would all get along. I think they would all, be a, you know, in school together, trying to figure it out. <laughs> it would be a, a really interesting social gathering. Yeah, we could, write, <laughs> we could write a book on Google Docs. This is what all of my students are doing. They just send me stuff on Google Docs now. No one turns in a PDF anymore. 
I, yeah, I, but I guess like my point, like my point is that like the, that question of whether Asian American women writers are going to last is a question of audience. Do we have an audience? Yeah. And I'm saying I'm your audience, you know, and yeah. there's, I can't be the only one. There's got to be more of me. So I'm glad that I'm able to publish and, you know, exist in the same pantheon as you guys. No, I mean, I think sometimes it's surprising, you know, Jean, when you had that great essay come out with the New York Times Magazine, I, and I was just, there's, there's a readership, right? There's a huge readership for that kind of stuff, but like, you don't know it until you write it, but sometimes writing it, like, because it's one of these things, you don't know there's an audience until you write it, but writing it could take a really long time, right? It could take years with an essay, it maybe takes like a month or two months, but you're putting in all this time without knowing if there's a readership. And like, I think one of my you know, good friends was like, well, how, wh wh why would you do that? There's like no insurance, <laughs> right? And I was like, well, that's a very pragmatic way of thinking about it, but um, it, it's true. You don't know about the audience until later. And then, you know, cause they're never gonna tell you they wanna read this book. Um, but of course there's a huge audience for Asian American literature and especially, you know, from the female lens. It's, it's a wonderful, it's, it's just wonderful material. But I think some of it is a publishing house like decision with that's like not really up to the the writers because I mean there have always yes. been Asian American writers but whether or not they get published is is a whole other thing and the fact yeah. that like, are very different books that are not like necessarily like classic immigrant stories in any way were all published by big houses and have gotten marketing support I mean that that helps open the door for for like the next wave of of Asian writers. Right, right. I mean, I think my agent is always saying, you know, you need to just make sure that you, this book does well and next book does well, sort of this like step um, ladder that you sort of keep going. You, I mean, I, you know, obviously it's, it's amazing if you sold your first book for like $5 million, but I think there's like no way to go up from $5 million advance. Right? <laughs> um, that's a really hard bar. So yeah, I think it's like the perpetual kind of like working on the next book, working on the next book, and then you know, growing your audience, which I think all of us have, and that's great. I want to pivot quickly to audience Q&A. So if audience members have questions for Jasmine, like here, Jean, please let us know. Um, I also am just so, I love this conversation so much. We we run a publishing conference at the workshop and the conversation that you're thinking through. I'm so happy that all of these books at major houses and have the marketing support and just so, so wonderful to have you all here. Um, the first question we have is from Rena Chen. It's specifically for Waiki. Um, I will read it out and then we'll turn it over to you. Um, it says, do you find that your Asian American readers read the book differently and the messages that readers glean are different? For example, referring to the title, Joan may not be totally okay, but she's not not okay in the way ascribed to her by people not from Asian immigrant families. Um, her neighbor Mark had great points about the forced leave and racism that Joan can't seem to face. That part where you trying to comment on how conversations about these topics happen, people can make great points, but still be wrong in their presumptions about Asian Americans. That, that's a really good question that um, it's hard for me to answer right away. Um, for Joan is okay, you know, the title, I'm very bad at titles. So the title that I, I thought of came when I wrote the first scene which was a gift um, that will never happen again. Um, and I knew that when I, you know, said title at Joan is okay, I would have to play with that title. Um, I love sort of ambiguity. I love gray areas. That's some, some, some aspect of nuance that I love. Um, with Joan is okay, I, I really do create, I really wanted to create a character that, you know, was very self, at least as a writer's perspective, very self-aware of certain stereotypes that go into Asian American health workers instead of, especially Asian American health workers who are women um, and sort of how they're treated. Um, and, you know, what I didn't want was Joan to sort of feel this sense of resentment. I kind of wanted her to be content throughout the entire story and have that sort of slowly aggravate the reader in a certain way um, of how can she be content with this life um, and so everyone is, is, is sort of piling in and projecting onto her. Um, and in many ways, you know, Joan is not a real character, right? She's a caricature in some ways, she's a flat character. Um, and I think flat characters sometimes make the best protagonists because you can kind of push them through a narrative in sort of an entertaining way um, while being able to write things about 
you know, how they think and later on. Um, and in the second half of the book, she does gain a stronger sense of awareness. So, you know, in writing Joan, I, I was very aware of certain stereotypes that go with this character. Um, I would never write a book in, in any way that would, you know, encourage those stereotypes. I think I'm, I'm trying to think about, well, we have these stereotypes, what are, what are we gonna do about them? You know, there's so many people well-versed in these kinds of things. And Joan represents 25% of the health workforce. And that is quite a bit given that we are now in this ongoing pandemic. Um, so I kind of wanted her to be seen on the page in a way that didn't necessarily belittle her, didn't put her in a box um, and gave her this like freedom to, to kind of express herself. It's mm. beautiful, thank you. Um, the next question is from anonymous attendee, but it is for all of you. Um, and it's what sorts of challenges or thresholds did you encounter when writing that were critical to forming your novel? Um, can I start with Jasmine? Do you what, mind? So what, so what <laughs> sorts of thresholds did you encounter? Yo, can you, could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. What sorts of challenges and or thresholds did you encounter when writing uh, that were critical to forming your novel? Honestly, just making the leap from short story writing to novel writing was, was pretty hard at the beginning. Um, just to, to decide, yes, I'm going to spend the next however many years of my life finishing this book. Um, so technically, all of it was challenging. And um, what I think I was just really struck by how much of a daily commitment is required to, to keep going with a novel because it's it's really hard year after year to not have like anything tangible to show, like to, to like have made progress in a way that you understand, but but that isn't actually anything to show the world yet. And you haven't because because I had been publishing, like I published two stories, like I published one story and published another story. And then for many years, it was um, like it, in our ho family holiday card, it'd be like still working on the book. <laughs> and so, and so until you sell the book, you're just still like, like not having like tangible progress to show your family, your friends, um, society. So I think there's just a lot of, um, like managing your own self-confidence, I think, with writing and like like sticking with it. Mm, thank you. Um, Jean, do you mind going next? Sure. Uh, what challenges and difficulties? Um, I mean, I, I really like what you said, Jasmine. I, re I remember one of your short stories from Tin House from like many years ago and that was I remember reading it being like oh I'm gonna keep an eye out for this person because she's gonna write something incredible um I think that uh gosh I think it's also just having like a thick skin for rejection because I got rejected so much um trying to place stories trying to query agents, um, you know, there's like applying to conferences, like just applying to PhD programs, applying to MFAs, um, applying to residencies. There's just so much rejection in this business. And I think it, it's really scary at the beginning, but you know, now I'm kind of just like, or at least for the last couple of years, um, I've just sort of been like, okay, I'm gonna let myself wallow for about five minutes and then I'm gonna just like keep it moving, you know? So I think there's, um, you know, the only other, like I have friends who are actors, I'm, I'm here in LA and I feel like that's like the only maybe other profession that where I have friends personally who they get even more rejection and it's even more brutal because I hear stories about them sitting in a casting room and everybody like looks like you in some weird way too. Um, so I think part of that rejection is also this feeling of scarcity you have about publishing because writing is one thing, you know, like Jasmine talked about sort of like the self preservation and self, like the faith you have to have in yourself, but to like publish a book and like be in the business of publishing a book, like getting an agent, getting a publisher is totally different from the time you spend writing. And I think even um, that part, like selling your book and even going through this 
publishing process. I know I've only been in it for a month. It's very difficult not to compare yourself to others, not to be like, well, why did they get this thing? Why am I not on that thing? And, you know, because publishing like all of capitalism is based on a system of scarcity, right? And so like, I don't want to feel like, oh, I'm competing with Jasmine because our books literally came out on the same day. And like, even for us, we've been exchanging messages from like months ago, like, oh, whatever, when you get, I'm going to like take that from me too. So I, just so you know, I am also a New York Times bestselling author because Jasmine was, and like, that's the kind of environment I'd like to create. I love that. Um, Waiki, do you want to answer this question as well? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think both of them said great things. I have to second that. Um, you know, sort of just doing your own thing, learning patience. That was very hard for me. Um, learning to work on a piece for years and months, dealing with, you know, very long editorial battles and fact checking. <laughs> Um, we have so many amazing questions and not that much time. So I'm gonna choose just a couple more before we wrap up. Um, so for all three of you, if you're okay sharing, how do you fight imposter syndrome? I know you're kind of talking about this a little bit already, but can you share one way that you do so? Whoever wants to hop in, Jasmine, yeah. I have, a, I have a very practical one. And one of my friends gave me this tip is to just, instead of um, looking at your present situation and all the things you're lacking in and why you're not good enough, like think about yourself like a year from today or a, a year ago or like five years ago, you know? So for me, five years ago, I was just starting my PhD program. I didn't have an agent, I didn't have a book. And so if five years ago, me could, see me right now she would be like so thrilled so that's one way that I try to just like uh time travel and have a little more perspective um, I would just say to limit your time on the internet as much as possible I I mean something that is it's very hard to do as you're launching a book um but yeah I I mean I I, I do echo Jean that that there is a lot of comparisons and we we are sharing all of our wins. And uh, uh, so I, I share all of mine with you. And I, I think the, yeah, I don't know what imposter syndrome feels like right now, just because we're all just in our little isolation boxes. Like, I think maybe like, when I when I did do an event um, and like they turned the lights down and like I was actually on the stage with the lights on me that was that was truly terrifying in a way that that Zoom is not. Um, but I I mean I haven't been like in an in person panel like before and like I maybe AWP this year is going to be a lot of that feeling of imposter syndrome or like other festivals that are coming up. But um, I mean I think the 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 benefit of of like publishing in my 40s is definitely that I'm I think I probably am a little bit less self-conscious than I would have been if this was happening at at 28. No that's that's I I think that makes a lot of sense and practice um writing a lot and you know like Jean said getting rejected writing really bad stories fixing them being very receptive to edits, um, working in the field and not sort of thinking about, you know, the sense of um, talent. I think um, ta talent is a gift. Sure, everyone has a different set of talents and materials, but craft is something that everyone works for. Um, and that, that can be a common denominator for a lot of things. Um, so, you know, pushing through that was actually really helpful for writing a second book and writing other things. Thank you. Um, one last question before we, we wrap up for the evening. Uh, this is from Cynthia. It says, do you ever feel conflicted between the way you want to write and your artistry as a bicultural storyteller, your authentic Asian American life experiences, and the demands of the white dominated commercial market? Did you feel compromised to get published? Who, who wants to take that first? I know that's a big one. Um, okay, since I turned my microphone, yeah. <laughs> just go first. Um, 
I I think because I queried agents after I had my my whole book done, I think that I probably evaded some of those compromises along the way because the only people who who saw like who saw the book as it was being written were my close friends who were reading it. So I I kind of tuned out the the publishing world voice and I mean I I think what I have found really satisfying is that I wrote the weird book that I wanted to write. I mean, the book that I produced is is quite strange and and it doesn't um it doesn't fit neatly in like um like genre boxes or like publishing industry categories and I felt like I was very lucky to have that freedom and I was able to to write a, a really thorny character and like a, a thorny female um, protagonist of color. And so that's mm -hmm. something that um, I'm not sure would have happened 15 years ago. And so I think it's it's partly the, the time in which you are selling your book. It's partly like what's been popular in the last like five years and like what conversation you're in, entering into so some of those are I, I think some of those things are just beyond one's control but it's I think it's really it's been really important to me to tune out the the voice that that says like this is what's going to sell and like this is what's going to be marketable. Jean I think when you're reading you read this great part about sort of not writing race into characters. And this is actually a huge argument I get into with my undergrad and grad students because they think if they don't write race, it's some something for the better in terms of whatever. Um, and I always have to convince them that in a dominant culture that's white, if you don't write the race, they, as it's, they assume that these characters are white. Um, and I think I've had a lot of students get mad at me about that, but why would I assume that uh, you're writing your own race if you never tell me or whatever, right? Um, and I think that's actually really something to think about because when I first started writing, I was doing as your character is doing. I was like, I'm not gonna talk about the race. I'm not gonna put in identity. I'm not gonna do any of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I think all of our books mention pretty early who these characters are and we just stick with that. And I think that's really important for creating these characters. It's just part of the storyline. It's not the defining feature of their storyline but it's totally part of their storyline and that, that's a burden, right? You kind of have to keep reminding the readers, hey, this character is, you know, Asian American or whatnot um, in, in, in the story. Um, and that can be exhausting, but I think you have to do it. It's so much part of the work of writing. So I'm really, you know, I just, I'm thankful of you reading that section because I should teach it to my students and then we could stop having that argument about not identifying your characters. Um. <laughs> uh... Well, thanks. Yeah, it was really fun to write that disgusting character, Jasper. <laughs> he's, um, he's just wrong in so many ways, but in my mind, he's like very hot and just delicious. Anyway, um, I think, so the question was about like publishing in a white supremacist society. Is that right? Yeah, and whether you had to compromise any parts of your, your stories, your writing to get published. Um, I don't think it came with the writing part because anybody, whether it was like agents I query, like Jasmine said, like I already had finished like most of the book. I did work on it with my agents after um, after signing with them, but like the agents that I queried and the agent that I ended up signing with was based on their, uh, you know, their current list of authors. So I'm with Aisha Pandey, she represents writers like Danielle Evans, uh, Patricia Ingle, Lisa Ko. And these are all um, writers who I admire, writers of colors who are writing about race and culture in a way that's meaningful. So, um, and I knew that I could trust um, Aisha and Serene, my agents to, to guide me through this publishing process and match me up with an editor. So my editor is a white woman um, and I think you know, she was, she is really smart. She asked so many great questions. And I got that since even from having a phone conversation with her. And of course I checked out um, the previous books that she had edited to see like who she had worked with, you know, did she pick me? And I'm the first Asian American writer that she's ever acquired. And, you know, that wasn't the case. She's worked with um, lots of different kinds of writers. So, um, 
I think that um, it's a negotiation. I didn't feel like I have to I had to compromise. But again, like going back to what I said to the previous question, the publicity and marketing part of things, I wouldn't say that I had to compromise, but um, they weren't all like this. You know what I mean? Like the moderator for my event wasn't always Asian American. When I was when I'm getting interviewed um, for radio or for book clubs, it wasn't an Asian American creator who was asking me these questions. I'm not saying that that's wrong or I like anything like negative happened with that, but it is just um, I think being here at the Asian American Writers Workshop, it's a very special and particular place. No, I think that comment about negotiation is so true. So much of publishing and working in any field is negotiation, right? Um, and sometimes you have to figure it out, but you know, it's a balance of being super idealistic about everything and then being, you wanna have your story be read and th that balance is really, really important, yeah. I am just so grateful for all of you for these the sweet words too about the Asian American Writers Workshop. We're so grateful to have a chance to make this space and then to kind of invite you all into it, even if we're all in our different sort of Zoom rooms at home. Um, I have one last question that we try to close our events with. We can do kind of a lightning round because I know we're a little bit over time. Um, you've done some of this already, but I really love to ask the authors we speak to you to kind of call absent friends into our space. I'd love really just some book recommendations. Who are you reading? Who are the Asian diasporic, Asian American writers that um, you'd like to, to share with our audience this evening? Um, I am- You can I do a show until I can see there's I, something around I, for books. <laughs> I cannot um, get up to grab books without showing you the sweatpants that I'm also wearing with this dress. So um, I'll just say that um, I'm really excited to read Brown Girls by um, Daphne Palasi Andriades, which- It's so um, good. It's just so good. It's so good. I read it in like, I don't know, like a day. Yeah. I'm really excited to read uh, Samantha Chang's new novel. Oh, the family yeah. now that looks really good too. I was reading, you know, cause I have to teach this like novella class at a school. So I like went back and I read Don Lee's Yellow. I don't, I, I, I don't know if like, this is something that, you know, I was- That's an Asian American classic. I wow. know, but I, I hadn't that. read it. And I just oh. felt like I was so done that I hadn't read it. It's so good. The last story, the novella, oh my gosh, the structure of that book. Um, if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. John Lee's no, like, you know, book, Yellow, but it's like the, the, the sequencing of that story collection is just really great. And I think that that's something that, you know, is hard to achieve. Oh, and I just, you guys are doing a, uh, an event with Samantha Chang on the 17th. Okay, so I am reading two poetry books. Um, I can show one that I have here and the other one's in my bathroom because I like to read when I'm like having my morning bathroom situation it's like great to anyway TMI but uh, this is called Barangay it's by an, a poet who's also an academic his name is Adrian De Leon he's um, Filipinx Canadian but he's now based here in LA and these are Barangay means um, it's like a kind of boat in pre-colonial Philippines so I'm really enjoying this poetry collection and the other one I'm reading is um, Constellation Roots, or The Constellation Root by um, Matthew Olsman, who I met through being um, a part of the Kundiman writing retreat. He's a wonderful poet. And um, that book is, it's all written in like epistolary form. So they're all like letters and he's, he, he, everything he writes is like very political, very smart, very tender, but also really funny all the time. He's just a great, um, really wonderful poet I admire. So those are my two current books. Amazing. Thank you all so much. So many books to read, so many friends as well that were mentioned. That was wonderful. Thank you.
Um, I want to make sure to thank really quickly our incredible interpreters from Pro Bono ASL, Chris, who's on screen with us right now, and Sarika, who was on screen earlier. Um, thank you so much, as always, to Pro Bono ASL. We're so grateful for you. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us online on a, a it's rainy in New York, at least, a rainy and icy Friday evening. Um, we're so grateful that you joined us. So excited to have you all in this space. Um, we're going to keep the Zoom open for another couple of minutes. If you want to just chat, share anything um, in the Zoom chat itself, we'll play a little bit of music. Um, and yeah, we hope everyone stays safe, stays healthy, and we will see you very soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.